Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this session about finding common ground between um, farmer knowledge and academic research. Um, I'll just introduce myself quickly first. So, uh, I'm Tara White. I'm the research coordinator for the Agroecology Research Collaboration. Um, and I also work in Scottish policy for the Land Workers Alliance. Um, I'll explain, I'm going to go and I'll chat a little bit more about the Agroecology Research Collaboration and what we do in a minute. Um, but yeah, we've got a really excellent panel here today. Um, I've got, we've got uh, Ben Adams, who's a full-time consultant as, and also a farmer in, from North Oxfordshire. We've got Holly Sylvester, who is, uh, works at Trill Farm Garden and also for the Seed Sovereignty Programme with the Gaia Foundation. We've got um, Angelina Sanderson Bellamy, Professor Angelina Sal Sanderson Bellamy from the University of West of England. Angelina has very kindly stepped in very last minute to be on this panel um, because uh, Dr. Jessica Stokes from the Royal Agricultural University um, is unfortunately unwell. Uh, so thank you, Angelina, for stepping in. And we also have uh, Dr. Julia Cooper from the Organic Research Centre. So I'm hoping that we can have a bit of a... Um, we're going to do some sort of quick introductions. Um, people will talk a little bit about their own in experience of research. But then we're going to try and have a bit of a kind of free-flowing discussion about some of the challenges of, you know, kind of bringing together academic research and farmer knowledge. Um, and hopefully it'll be fairly free-flowing and plenty of opportunity to participate if you've got questions or if you want to add anything to the discussion. Um, so first of all, just a little bit about where, where the kind of agroecology research collaboration and this, this kind of session originally comes from. Uh, so obviously there are the agroecology movement and farm, agroecological farmers and growers, there are actually quite a lot of research needs um, we're trying to completely transform our food system, uh, food and farming system. So obviously, f in order to achieve that, we actually, yeah, you know, we need to know quite a lot of things. Um, and there's, there's a huge amount going on on people's farms. People are trialing new things. They're um, trialing old things. You know, there's a huge amount of innovation that's happening. Um, but for the work that we're doing and for the level of transformation that we're trying to see, we really need some kind of, yeah, sort of fairly large scale research. The two kind of main places where, certainly within the Land Workers Alliance and some of the other organizations in the agroecology research collaboration, the areas that we were seeing a real need for research um, is firstly for, for campaigning and lobbying for policy advocacy work and also for people to, to market what they're doing, to show what they're doing, the benefits of what they're doing on their own farms. Um, and so for this, things like actually just being able to evidence the benefits of agroecology is really important. There, there just really isn't that much out there to sh so that we can sort of categorically show the benefits. Looking at things like the impact of, of different practices on biodiversity, soil health, carbon sequestration, and then also the much more broader social benefits. We might be looking at community resilience, um, for example, mental health benefits. There's a huge range of different sort of the holistic benefits of agroecology that um, it would be really great for our movements if we could we could demonstrate. Um, it's also important to have research into things like financial viability and the productivity of small farms for policy and advocacy work so that we can, you know, we can show that, that, that our sort of vision of, a, of the future is viable. Um, and also that to provide evidence for, specific, potentially for specific things, you know, why we might need specific s support for new entrants, that there is interest from people in getting into farming if they had the support, that kind of research as well is really useful for our advocacy work. Then there's the improving pr practice on farms, on market, in market gardens, um, like actually, yeah, actually the practices that we're kind of employing on the ground. Um, and for that, it, it's really useful to have kind of reliable data on the impact of specific practices. Um, it could also, you know, try, yeah, trialing new innovations, underutilized crops, for example, um, new technologies that work well with, in an agroecological context, older practices that we, yeah, we want to bring back, you know, all of that, those different practices, it's great if we've got data and we can share that with each other um, between farmers, um, yeah, so that we can all improve our, our practice. And the other things that are really useful, I think, for improving practice, like kind of at the farm level, are things like case studies of different 
mar routes to market, for example, and how that's worked. Um, yeah, financial modeling, things like that, that can really like support people, especially when they're starting out or changing their, transitioning their farm. So there were so many different needs that we could see as organizations. And then there's also really quite a lot of funding available for agricultural research and sort of sustainability. Um, these are some of the images that I got when I googled UK sustainable agriculture funding. Um, these are from, <laughs> a lot of them are from the, the UKRI website. So this is the kind of conventional idea of, of what sustainable agriculture is going to look like. It's sort of dramatic shots of monocultures, but really big ones. And quite a lot of iPads, like everything is going to be done on iPads. Um, there's really a lot of money going into, um, going into agriculture, and that's whether you look at agricultural research. Some, some of that specifically going into agricultural research, and some of it goes into more broadly into kind of um, biological research, but where people are sort of saying the impacts will be for, for um, agriculture. I think, yeah, it's worth saying my own background is in biological research, in plant biology. Um, where I, I was working in looking at crop management practices and I worked with a lot of people doing really interesting research but a lot of people would were funded based on the idea that their research would eventually eventually lead to the development of super GM crops. Um, so that kind of funding, that sort of millions of pounds is also coming under this kind of big budget. There, there is loads of this money out there and not much of that is getting to the kind of agroecology movement, to, the, to research on agroecology. Um, regenerative, something. Sometimes it would be called regenerative, but then you still get a picture like this. Um, so yeah, there it does exist, but it's the, the money exists, but it's going really into kind of high tech and large scale. And then there's also like whether it, even when there is, obviously sometimes there might be real world impa impacts that are negative, but sometimes there actually just aren't. You know, there, it never. None of the research really has any impact on farms. It's not answering the questions that are that are important to, to farms, it's answering questions that are potentially really interesting and important to science, but don't actually connect with what's happening on farm at all. Um, so these are, these are the kind of two sides of the question. So this is the sort of context in which we started the Agroecology Research Collaboration. It's a collaboration of five farmer-led organizations, farmer and grower-led. So we've got the Land Workers Alliance, the Ecological Land Cooperative, the CSA Network, Pasture for Life and the Organic Growers Alliance. Um, and we worked, yeah, we worked together as part of this collaboration that was started in 2021. I've been working with the collaboration since 2022. Um, so yeah, collectively, these organizations employ a research coordinator, which is me, um, to, make, to make some of these connections between what's happening in academia and what's actually happening in the agroecology movement. I'm just going to read through these because that seems like the easiest way to do it. But these are the kind of <laughs> overall aims that we have behind the Agroecology Research Collaboration. I'm going to call it ARC from now on because it's a bit quicker. So to represent and further the research needs of agroecological practitioners across the UK, to develop a network of connections with researchers and research institutes to co-create relevant research that's based on principles of mutual support and exchange, to build a strong evidence base that demonstrates agroecology as a viable and long-term alternative to the current industrial and land use system. To ensure that ARC members, the wider network of grassroots organizations representing those working in food, farming and forestry are actively involved in and have an equal stance in developing and steering research agendas. So that's the kind of like what we're trying to achieve with it. I've just got a little bit about the sort of thing that we've done in the past couple of years. Um, but yeah, we're still, still pretty new and still trying to, you know, expand and, um, yeah, build, build bigger networks. So we've done some, some quite a bit of work bringing together academic researchers and farmers. Um, we've had gatherings of research. We've had two kind of whole day workshops with researchers and farmers. Um, that first one, it looks quite empty because it was socially distanced. Um, and then we've had some things where we've brought together people, um, you know, the second picture is people on working on a community farm with um, people who are themselves working in soil science and bringing them together to kind of do some soil testing together. Um, that, there's a picture at the end from our, we had a panel last year where we kind of launched at the ORFC, um, looking at sort of more farmer-led research and how that can tie in better with what's ha happening in academia. And in 2024, we are planning to have a 
conference, we've got some funding to have a conference um, looking at the kind of the breadth of agroecology research that is happening, both from a farmer-led and an academic perspective, um, kind of across disciplines. So we're hoping that we can have a bit of a presentation of you know, the act what research is out there, because there is some really exciting stuff happening. One of the other things we do is, yes, yeah, support, support with research projects through a, a variety of different ways. Um, we've put together this research guidance booklet, which is for um, researchers at all different stages of their careers who want to work with agroecological practitioners to look at, you know, how we, how we can make sure that that isn't an extractivist relationship, basically. Um, how we can, we can make sure that academics working with farmers, you know, it's a beneficial relationship for everyone. Um, I know that a lot of our um, members get approached really quite regularly to be interviewed for things and just make, making sure that we can make that as useful a process for everyone as possible. Um, that's available on the Land Workers Alliance website. We've collaborated on different research projects looking at things like local food systems, uh, new entrants to agroecology, um, different ways of measuring the benefits of polyculture, a variety of different things, and we have collaborated to different degrees. In some cases, we've been a, a partner. In some cases, we've just we've um, you know taken part in kind of workshops as part of that pr the research process. In some cases, we have more kind of informal advisory meetings. Um, I also do a fair amount of work advising on the development of research projects and funding bids, um, sometimes writing letters of support for funding bids, for example, and um, sh like finding ways in which it might be useful to the members of the different organisations in ARC. Um, also, we do quite a lot of work with students, particularly postgraduate research students. So um, one of the things that, that I do is I, you know, researchers contact me, students contact me, particularly your masters and PhD students, um, when they're wanting to do work in the field of agroecology and then I meet with them and we discuss their project and how they might be able to work with members in our different organizations or what questions, how they might be able to frame their question in a way that's useful. We have a kind of research priorities document that we've put together across our organizations of things that seem relevant to our members, but that's a sort of ever evolving process. And I, yeah, we've supported over 150 postgraduate research students, and that's through, in some cases, that's been, you know, going into colleges and teaching about research methods, and in some cases, it's been um, sort of act active supervision of specific students on specific projects. So there's a range of different ways that we can support um, students who are working in this field. And I do, I feel like there's a lot of really exciting early career research happening in agroecology. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's very important to support that. The other thing that we are trying to do is support farmer-led research. Um, so we know that a lot of members of all our organizations are really actively involved with carrying out research themselves on their own farms, in their own market gardens, um, in forestry as well. So yeah, finding ways that we can support that. So we have, over the past year, been working on this Experts in Their Field project, which is where we got some funding. This is. This is actually UKRI funding. I know I s showed those pictures earlier from the monocrops, but they are also funding things like this. Um, so we, we had some funding for it's for, for a community-based research, so with our community being agroecological practitioners, um, and this provides funding for people to, yeah, to really carry out their own on-farm research, looking at the questions that are important to them. And these are some of the... Oh. See, these are some photographs from... Um, some of the, the trials and tests that were done in the past year and um, my new colleague Isabel Tox is taking this project forward in the next year um, so yeah if there is anyone here who's a farmer or grower or um, another type of land worker who's interested in getting involved in research and having a little bit of funding and a bit of support with doing their own research in the next year um, I can point you in the right direction for that that's a kind of yeah, brief introduction to, to the agroecology research collaboration. Um, and so sort of where I'm coming from with, with chairing this panel. Um, I'm going to ask the panel members to introduce themselves now, and then we'll move into a bit more of a, a discussion. Um, Julia, would you like to start us off? Oh, could you come up here? Yeah. I've got notes. Hello. Hello everyone. Yeah, I'm Julia Cooper, um, and I'm just going to do a really quick, hopefully less than five minutes. Tara's going to cut me off if I go too long. Uh, 
Oh, oh yeah. I don't have slides, actually. I took a big risk and didn't do PowerPoint slides, which, you know, is very nerve-wracking for someone, an academic, to not to have their PowerPoint slides. But I thought, I'm just going to extemporize, so this is why you're going to cut me off when I go on and on. Yeah, so Tara gave me three things to do. First of all, talk about who I am. So I'm Julia Cooper. Um, I'm head of research at Organic Research Centre. But for the past, for prior to about a year ago, I was at Newcastle University for around 17 years, I think. So I started out kind of as a lowly research associate and kind of tried to climb up to become a lecturer, a senior lecturer. And then I jumped ship over to the charitable sector. So now I'm in or, at Organic Research Center, head of research. Um, and I'm a soil scientist by training. So I studied soils back in the 80s, a long time ago in Canada. And I'm very much a classically trained soil scientist. Um, and my real passion is studying carbon and nitrogen and how they cycle through agricultural soils. So my whole career, I've always studied carbon and nitrogen, often um, in organic systems or using organic amendments, really interested in crop rotations, farming systems, how we can optimize uh, those cycles to make them most efficient, basically. So we retain carbon and we don't lose nitrogen and it's there for the crops when they need them. That's kind of my real passion. Um, so research I've been involved in. So yeah, it's been a long, I've done a lot. I started to write and I was like, oh, this is too long. Um, but I did want to say, I kind of like to frame it um, thinking about different types of research, because Tara, you talked about research uh, being done that you thought sometimes wasn't very relevant or useful or applicable to farmers. And it's true, some research that we do as academics is what you might call fundamental or basic research. And it's really that research that underpins our understanding of the world and how it works. So biology, chemistry, physics. Um, it's really fun, fundamental research. It's also the stuff that often gets uh, scientists really to progress in their career very well because it's very focused, might be called reductionist. Uh, but it should underpin sort of our understanding of systems. And ideally, I knew I had colleagues at Newcastle who used to say it's agnostic. It's just, we just do it and we put the knowledge out there. We, we know that's not really true, right? There's all kinds of agendas and ways that it's funded and ways that it's used that you alluded to. So um, even that fundamental basic research, you know, is used, you know, we have to be aware that it's not taking place in a vacuum and it may be serving certain interests and maybe we need to get in there and make sure it's being, you know, serving agroecological interests. So you have that fundamental basic research. I did some of that around how carbon and nitrogen cycles in soils. I've done a lot more of the applied practical research, stuff like our colleagues at AHDB do an awful lot of, um, you know, field trials. I didn't do them myself, but you guys do these amazing networks of trials around the country and really get useful information, I think, that that you know, underpins the recommendations you make to farmers. And you know, when I was at Newcastle, I used to often cite RB209, and that might be heresy in this room, I don't know. I think it's a great resource. It is based on you know, hundreds of trials over the years. It is primarily about how to use fertilizers, but it's also got a lot of good stuff on manures and stuff, so don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I did, you know, I've done that sort of work as well. And then now at ORC, I feel I'm much closer to the cold face, and a lot more of the work I do is like consulting almost what you call consultancy, like one-on-one -on -one with farmers. So there's trade-offs there, because when you do that more one-on-one -on -one work directly with a farmer, it's very site-specific. They get a lot of benefit, but how do you take that and then translate it into something that you can more generally give advice on? Anyway, I've already started to ramble terribly. Okay, let me go back to what I'm supposed to be saying. Oh yeah, what have I done with an actual impact? I had to really rack my brains for this one. Oh my god. Um, well, one thing I wanted to say was that as, an, as a scientist, you hope you're contributing to the body of knowledge in your area. So that's why publishing is so important to us. And again, some of you might think, oh, why, why academics so focused on publishable research? But it is really important that if you do something, any research, the research that we're all doing, try and get it published somehow out there, because otherwise you're just, we're just destined to do it over and over again. And I do see that, that there's a lot of, um, you know, reinventing the wheel going on when there's been so much work done in the past on so many of these agroecological practices. So, yeah, so I hope I've contributed to a wider body of knowledge. One thing I did do a few years ago that I thought was, I was quite pleased with, um, related to a nitrogen model I'd worked with that a company wanted to use within their software to give advice to farmers. And I gave them some advice on how to kind of translate this 
this uh, you know, computer model that simulates nitrogen and how it gets supplied to plants and turn it into something that made some useful um, advice to farmers about fertilizer and where they might be losing nitrogen and stuff. So that was one thing I thought of that, that had a direct effect. Now, how have I worked in a participatory way? Yeah, again, I have to do a lot of confessing up here. It's very confessional. Um, extractive relationship. I wrote that down. I hadn't heard that term. When we go to farmers and say, uh, we've got some funding to do some research on this thing. Um, would you like to do it with us? Sadly, that's a lot of the way that I've worked. So a lot of the work I've done has been on-farm research. Um, and because of the nature of the way farming, uh, funding works, you often haven't been able to really actively involve the end you know, participants until you've got the funding. And then you run out and try and find someone to work with you. So um, you know, this started back in Thailand in the 80s. I worked in Thailand as a volunteer. And um, I used to go out and visit farms and say, Why don't you, would you like to try some green manures? Uh, would you like to try growing some trees in the fields? I'm sure they thought I was crazy, but because I was like an interesting foreigner riding up on a motorcycle that kind of was exciting, they let me go and do these weird things in their fields. i do not not sure they got so much out of it, but that's sort of where it started. So I did work on farms in Thailand quite a bit on green manures and alley cropping agroforestry in the 80s, which is now 40 years later, uh, quite a big thing here. Um, but fast forwarding to ORC, where I work now, again, I do feel like we're much more, are working a participatory way with farmers. We have these living labs, which are um, these networks of farmers that we work with, uh, answering questions on things like varieties, what's the best variety to grow in your system. Uh, living mulches is another one we're doing quite a bit of, bit of work on, um, which is really, kind of really pushing the boundaries. We think it's really tough to implement these permanent covers of clovers in fields and drill into them. But we also think, uh, you know, I think this year, especially with the soil erosion we're seeing around the country, we really need to do something about covering our soils better. Uh, and then agroforestry too, so working with farmers um, with trees. So those we have sort of living labs where we have these networks of farmers where we're working together on research questions. So that is more of an equal relationship, I think. And then the project we had in ORC that's probably been the most participatory is this one we called Oath, which was or called Organic at the Heart, where we went to funders saying we want to embed ourselves in local communities of food producers and um, really just identify what their challenges are and work beside them to come up with solutions. We couldn't promise any outcomes to the funders. We couldn't promise when things would happen, what would happen, and that made it very risky and very, you know, very challenging to sell and then to report back to funders when in some cases it just, for whatever reason, we hadn't, you know, done anything sort of dramatic with the community and in some cases it sort of ran its natural course. In other cases, I've got a situation in Cornwall where we're going on to the next step with that group of growers of trying to get more funding so they can start to on their own kind of um, set up some networks for food distribution, which turned out to be the question they wanted to answer. Um, so that's kind of scary for researchers to do it that way, but that is truly participatory, um, but very much harder to get funding for that when you're not sure what the questions are even going to be or what the outcome is going to be. So that's kind of an example of that. So I think that's everything I'm going to say at this point, Tara. I hope that wasn't too long. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, that was great. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, Holly, would you like to introduce yourself next? I wonder if my slides are going to magically appear. Yay, <laughs> thank you. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Holly. Uh, I'm not an academic. I am a vegetable and a seed grower. Uh, I'm based at Trill Farm Garden in Devon. I've been there for the past couple of seasons. Um, we grow for local restaurants and cafes and wholesale and we run uh, an organic veg box scheme. Um, we also grow a lot of seed on contract for the real seed company and Vital Seeds. Um, seed is one of my passions. So I also work for the Gaia Foundation Seed Sovereignty Programme. Um, and actually transitioning into a new role with them at the moment where I'll be facilitating a crowd breeding project this coming year, which is allowing me to kind of embrace my interest in uh, all the geeky stuff. So genetic diversity, going to be exploring the connections between seed and the soil microbiome, 
Um, and this is going to be a fully pharma-led collaborative trial, so I hope it's going to have really exciting outcomes. Um, as a grower, oh, I've gone back, I've gone too far. <laughs> um, yeah, as a grower, I've been experimenting with on-farm trials, I guess, if that's what we want to call them, um, over the past few years. I guess uh, largely driven by my relentless interest in all things soil, um, but also the understanding that innovation often starts from the ground up. Um, and as growers and as farmers, we have really valuable knowledge um, that we can contribute to the research process. This past season, I've been carrying out several trials at Trill with support from the experts in their field fund that Tara just mentioned. Um, it's a, I think it's a really innovative funding stream that's enabled people that wouldn't normally be involved in research, but bring that on the ground knowledge that I just mentioned um, and are able to implement their own research ideas and like, get support with that and very crucially the funding to make that kind of a more robust research project on their farm. Um, so at Trill, this, this research, um, this funding has enabled us to conduct a more extensive and robust research and we've also been working closely with the soil ecology lab, so Adam Swan has been giving us guidance. Uh, I guess the overarching research, um, sorry, the overarching success of these trials has been demonstrating how quantitative and qualitative measures can come together and kind of help provide a more comprehensive overview of what's happening with our, within our own unique context. So as well as running the trials at Trill and working as a grower and for the Gaia Foundation, um, I'm also currently fortunate enough to be um, learning from Nicole Masters and her team. I'm sure some of you might have heard of her. I'm on the Integrity Soils Create program. It's a really technical program. We're taking a deep dive into the theory, principles and practice behind healthy agroecological systems. And we're also learning how to coach others on their journey and transition into these systems to make real change happen. Um, and then I'll be following up this period of study with a trip to the US and Canada this summer. Um, I was awarded a Churchill Fellowship, so I'm going to be researching collaborative and dynamic approaches to seed and hopefully bringing these two worlds together. And that's where my journey is at the moment, and who knows what will happen next. But that's a very whirlwind summary of, of me. So, yeah, I'll leave it there, Tara. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Um, Angelina, would you be able to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. So I'm Angelina Sanderson Bellamy. Um, about 15 minutes ago, I realized I was going to be talking about five minutes about myself. Um, so hopefully I touch on the points that Tara wanted us to do so. Um, so I'm a professor of food systems at University of the West of England, Bristol. Um, I started my academic journey at Cardiff University as a research associate in um, the end of 2015, and I was awarded some funding, about £300,000 in 2016, and that, that was an interesting experience from which I learned loads about how not to do research. And um, that was a sort of funding part by the UK Research Councils, which was targeting overseas development assistance. So it was called GCRF, Global Challenges Research Fund, and it was targeting research overseas in developing countries. And this project, I, I have a long history of work in Latin America, and this project was in Mexico, and it was the, the starting of UKRI using the terms around co-production that the research project should be co-produced with research partners. Um, of course, that's a difficult thing when you're at the start of your journey and you haven't actually started these relationships yet. And so I built something that somehow UKRI thought looked like co-production, although absolutely wasn't. Um, and then we tried to kind of backpedal once we had the money and tried to do co-production, which was even more challenging because you've already made promises of what you're going to do, and then you're trying to balance that with competing priorities of what the people you're working with actually want to do, and how do I put this all together and, and make everyone happy and get more money? <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, it all went okay, but it was, it, was a really, it was a real learning lesson, which is what happens when you're at the start of your journey. And... Um, 
at that time as well, I live in South Wales and I was driving down the road one day, you know, still relatively new to the region, and I passed a farm that said um, monthly organic meat box. And I was like, oh, wow, that sounds really interesting. I'm vegetarian, but my family eat meat. And so I was really interested and pulled in, had a chat with the farmer there, and you know, we signed up for the meat box and was just really interested in what he was doing. And, um, you know, it wasn't any, any sort of agenda, but just I could recognize, ooh, there's, there's an opportunity here. I don't know what that is yet, but there's something here. And so, you know, we continued those conversations. And then that farmer said to me in 2018, he said, I'm going to start a veg box scheme. So he, to give some context, he's about 800 acres, he's a tenant farmer, they are, are certified organic, agroecological, and they do, it's meat, is what they've always done. It's sheep, cattle, and um, pig. And he said, but I'm gonna start a veg box scheme. And he said to me, I'm really interested, I'd like to do some research and look at how this veg box scheme can influence food culture in, in the community around me. And he said that, I was like, ooh, that's brilliant. Yes, let's do that. And so this was one of those happy, circum happy sort of coincidences where straight away a funding opportunity came up. We sort of talked more, developed the ideas. I put forward a funding proposal. And within two months, we had 650,000 pounds to go and do research on how building relationships back into the food system could lead to healthy and sustainable outcomes for the food system. So that was a three-year project of working together with my farming colleague and friend, and um, we worked with other farms as well, and that went really well, that project, and we had really interesting outcomes from it. Um, but we were left with many questions still, and so one of the main outcomes was that um, those who had recently joined a veg box scheme compared to our control group, that their diet shifted and they were consuming less meat, more vegetables, less fat, less sugar, and overall the carbon associated impacts of their diet was 28% lower compared to our control group. So we were like, this is brilliant, you know, these are the kinds of shifts we need to be making, and it shows that it is possible that the British public will willingly consume a diet that is healthier and lower emissions. Um, but we all know that, sorry to say, but veg box schemes are a white middle class phenomenon. And I was very interested, how can we ex extend these benefits to the rest of the population have a more diverse um, population as well. And so talked with my farmer and colleague who was on the same page with me and he's like, you know what, I really want to um, experiment with solidarity model. And I want to make my veg box available to low income households because everybody should be able to benefit from my vegetables. And I was like, brilliant, yes, let's do this. So I roped together some money from different places, you know, relatively small funding pots this time around. Um, got, again, other farmers on board who were interested in that same purpose. And we set off on another project, and that was a journey with the farmers. And started that project, we were, okay, we're gonna work with roughly 10, 15 households per farm, and there'll be low-income, food-insecure households. I had no idea, actually, how are we going to identify these households? And then my um, farming colleague, he said, you know what, I've actually, I've dropped into a charity down the road from me, and I had a chat with them, and they're working with low-income households, and they said that they could, they could manage that side of it, they could bring in the households to the project, and, and that I'll just make the bags available. And I was like, oh. Brilliant, that's a great idea, yes. So took it to the other farms, and I was like, you know what, if you can partner up with a local food aid charity, then they'll have those relationships in place. And it was such an interesting process, and actually that became one of the really interesting outcomes was that those farms that had a good relationship in place with the food aid charity partner had much less turnover and much um, more successful outcomes at the end of that project. So that was very much a practice of co-production, working together, ideas coming from, from my partners who were not academics. It, it doesn't matter to me. I'm very much 
um, very keen working with practitioners, working together because practitioners are the ones working on the ground and have the experience and the knowledge of what might work and what definitely doesn't work. And I'm an academic, I don't have that knowledge, but I have other knowledge and skill sets that I bring. And, and I'm able to go and get that funding from UKRI because I know how to play that game. I know how to write those proposals, which probably seem a little bit like a foreign language to most other people, but that's the language that I can speak. And so, um, you know, all of this, I, I believe really, really strongly in co-production and stakeholder engagement. I just started a master's program at UE Bristol. It's in its first year now with students, but it's sustainable food systems, and it's about how do we transform our regional food systems. And one of the modules is agroecology. Another a module, another, the methods module is about co-production and place-based methods. So again, it's about all the things that we're talking about here right now. And I believe those are important things, and that's what we need to be teaching the next generation of researchers. And so the master's students, their dissertations are co-supervised with practitioners, and that the project should be developed together with that practitioner partner so that it's a project that addresses a need, identified need on the ground, and not some airy-fairy idea that we come up with in our academic buildings and institutions that are somewhat out of touch with what the needs are on the ground. Um, and lastly, I'll just say I'm also, so a year ago I was awarded five million pounds from UKRI. UKRI really like me. Um, <laughs> and that project, it's called the Agri-Food for Net Zero Network Plus. So it's not a research project. It's a network building project. And again, this aligns with my own personal interests of stakeholder engagement. And the objectives, there's a few of them, but it's to build a UK-wide community of practice across the agri-food system to create convergence around what the pathway to net zero should look like for the food system. So that's a big challenge because there's a lot of divergence across the agri-food system on how we get to net zero. And so I, I don't say consensus, I say convergence. So it's just about trying to bring those different um, groups and communities closer together in alignment. And um, through that exercise to identify actually what are the research needs to get us to net zero. So we've done an, a series of exercises of the last year, um, which is looking at plausible future scenarios. Um, and that's thinking about what, does, what will 2050 look like? Because we commonly make the mistake of thinking of 2050 will be like it is today, and it definitely won't be. The last five years has shown us that it, it definitely won't be as it is today. And if we prepare for that future, assuming it's going to be like today, then we're preparing to fail and to not be ready for the challenges that we'll be facing in trying to reach net zero. So these plausible future scenarios, um, actually we, we have four of them, and you can see more on um, our website. Um, but Three of those are based in futures where food is produced in small scale, food production systems. And so as a result of these outcomes, it's looking at, you know, so across these different scenarios, how can we spread our eggs across different baskets so that we can be as prepared as possible? And then what's the research we need to get us there? And that's part of our objective is informing then the research councils that these are the kinds of priorities that they need to be funding. So in, we're still, we have another two years to go, but already we've identified six sort of funding priorities, and one of those is circular food systems, and urging that we need to be putting more money into small-scale agriculture, agroecologically produced food, because that is more likely going to be part of our future growing systems than the current large scale investments that we make in high tech agricultural approaches. So, sorry that was maybe a bit long winded, but that's an introduction to me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Angelina, and thank you for doing that so last minute. I really appreciate it. Uh, ben, would you like to introduce yourself? I think, I think there's some slides for this as well. 
Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's still awake. I'm sure there's a few sore heads after last night, but I'll try and uh, keep you all entertained with some nice photos. Um, I can't really remember what's in the slides because I did them a couple of weeks ago, but we'll see. So, this is me. My name is Ben Adams. I am from a farm in North Oxfordshire. I am absolutely not an academic or a researcher or anything like that. I hated doing my dissertation at university. I don't like citations, it all drives me insane. <laughs> um, so the farm at home, we're a very sort of general combinable cropping farm that is trying to move to more of a regenerative agroecological, agro whatever you want to call it, sort of system. Um, and I am a full-time consultant as well, do mostly environmental schemes and grants, a lot of general business advice. And um, whenever I'm not doing that, I am a farmer. So this is the sort of stuff we're doing on the farm at home. We do a lot of hay. We try to integrate sheep into the system as much as possible. We don't have our own sheep anymore, so we let a lot of land out. So cover cropping, for example, for two local graziers. Um, both new entrants, which are a lot easier to control than the two older shepherds we have before, which has been great, so I can get the sheep moved when I want, which is working really well. Um, we are in the Sustainable Farming Incentive Pilot Scheme. I'm very big into environmental schemes, and I think they're absolutely brilliant. We have about 10% of the entire farm is dedicated to plots for winter bird food mixes or for nectar-rich flower plots and buffers and all the rest of it as much as you can imagine. And we're also trying to improve all the woodland we have on the farm. It's all ancient managed native woodland. So we're going around and kind of thinning and allowing light back into the canopy and uh, the growth it's seen in the last five, six years has been incredible because um, we don't have sheep on the farm anymore. We've got to entertain ourselves over the winter now. Um, so we're doing a local uh, firewood delivery service as well. So, I do a lot of trials on the farm, and they're very much a tramline here, a tramline there, nothing really done very seriously, but last year I applied for a net zero competition, and this was kind of my solution to net zero, how it could work within a normal combinable cropping farm, and that was intercropping. You can't really see on there. But intercropping is effectively the process of growing more than one crop at the same time. And in my case, I was trying to take them both to harvest. How I wangled this to get the funding into a net zero competition was I wanted it to complete no, about as no input as I could get to kind of set a bit of a baseline so I could only improve from there. Um, I wanted to always have a legume in the mix for the nitrogen fixation. Um, I wanted to do a minimum amount of cultivations as well. And yeah, basically see what worked and see what didn't. It had to make financial sense and it had to fit in within a normal arable combinable cropping system. Otherwise, we're not going to get other people that want to try this. Um, so those were all the sponsors that luckily gave me a lot of money. Nowhere near the scale of what I've just heard. Christ, I'm a bit jealous. <laughs> um, but basically, I did nine, nine plots of different mixes so they were all no-till drilled into a desiccated overwinter cover crop um, and effectively received absolutely zero inputs the whole way till harvest and then were weighed. You can't see that, but basically there's a cost in there. I, as I'm a consultant, I sit in front of Excel a lot of the time, so I don't, I don't do anything properly. I don't do any of that positive correlation, that R-squared stuff. I'm sure if some of you have been to university, you remember it. Horrible. Hate it. Um, so <laughs> all, all mine is done on Excel. It's very airy-fairy. There's no replicated trials. There's none of that stuff. It's all done. This is what works practically within a farming system. Um, basically, we got some good results, and it works, <laughs> is, is the long and short of it. It does work. Um, and... You can't quite see because it's a little bit blurry, but even comparing it to the bottom of a conventional system, one was our oats grown in a more conventional system and the neighbour's beans, which he um, kindly provided the data for me. Um, it was definitely comparable within a system, but obviously required very minimal inputs. 
Um, so the idea was effectively to keep it as a break crop within a traditional system. And if I can grow an extra seed on top of that that I can use, in example, for an environmental seed mix or in a cover crop mix that are normally bloody expensive, if I can grow that myself and use it myself, then I'm saving a lot of money. And that's the idea. If you want people to adopt these different things, they need to be viable and they need to work because people have bills to pay, they have rents to pay, they have mortgages to pay. So it did work. Um, yeah, that's the thing. I wanted to say farmers trust farmers. You know, the average age of a farmer in the UK is 59. Some of, the, some of these typical old farmer blokes, they're never going to read an academic paper. So we need to get farmers to... That, that link between academic research and actual farmers, because farmers trust farmers. And I know that because I'm one. And a lot of the time, the academic research is a few years behind because it takes time to produce it. I mean, that's just, that's just sensible. But we need to link the farmers with the researchers and get the farmers involved because that's when farmers will start trusting and that's when they'll start listening. Um, and that's another thing. Get as many people involved. If you're a farmer yourself, get people onto the farm. Show them what can happen because that's how you get the word out there. I don't want to read an academic paper, but I'll go to a farm walk, especially if there's a bacon butty and a cup of tea there. So get, get people involved. So getting people around the trials, meeting with, these are two from people from Anglian Water. Get those all local stakeholders, especially the people with money, to come onto the farm. Even though Anglian Water didn't give me any money for some trials I wanted to run this year, even though I did invite them to the farm and give them a cup of tea, but oh well. I'm not, I'm not bitter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't give him the bacon butty. Perhaps that might have helped. I oh, will. And that's it. There's just some pictures from the trials to keep, because they all look nice and pretty. But yeah, get farmers involved with researchers and just talk, just spread the message, go to farms, go to chats. It's talking, that's how you're going to get it done, I think is the right way. Anyway, my name is Ben Adams. Thank you very much. <laughs>
We have survived as a species because we can experiment, solve problems, innovate, reflect, adapt, and fundamentally communicate, listen, and collaborate in communities. We will thrive again by doing the same. I wish you all a beautiful ORFC and an experimentally collaborative 2024. Um, great, so now we'll, we'll move on to a bit more of a discussion and hopefully it'll be really interesting because we've got such a diverse panel. We've got, yeah, academic researchers in sort of more sort of soil science um, as well as a food systems approach, so quite different angles. And then we've got um, independent research on, uh, mar on market gardens, looking at soil and um, vegetable growth and plant health. And then we've also got independent research um, on our, at a kind of arable farm scale um, and trial plots there. So hopefully we've got, got plenty of interesting things to discuss. Um, so I think if we, we start with just a kind of sort of fairly open question, um, like from, from your experience, what do you think is, you know, is there a disconnect between the sort of ac academic research agenda um, and what's, ha what's actually happening on farm, what the priorities of farmers are? Um, I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> so, I think you could call it a lot of things. Disconnect is one word you could use. I think what is challenging is that the relationships and the communication channels aren't there. I don't think it's necessarily a lack of a will to do so, but oftentimes, if you don't know people on the ground, um, if you're sort of, I think for researchers, it's not part of their day-to-day -day job to engage. I think that there's a lot of pressures put on researchers, and you know we have this wonderful thing in universities called the workload model. And the workload model does not give you workload bundles for engaging, that which is, I feel like, the, the foundation of successful research, building those relationships, having those relationships in place so that you're, you're exchanging ideas, it, having the conversations out of which ideas come. Um, and if those aren't happening, then it's really difficult to, then, then a disconnect does appear because you don't have that exchange of ideas. and. I think that is, on the research side, the problem. And what I hear often from researchers complaining is, oh, farmers are so busy. You know, it's so hard to get them to come along. And, and I'm not saying that's a justified argument. I think that there's ways and means of, of making that happen. But that is one of the challenges as well in, in terms of that engagement process, that building the relationship and, and being able to communicate with each other and identify those sort of um, ideas that are worth moving forward with. I could say something too. Yeah, um, I was thinking about this before because you told us you might ask us this question. Um, I do think yeah, there's a bit of a misalignment sometimes. I think academics, like you've said, we're, we're under so much pressure to do research that's publishable. Uh, so um, the work that I'm, I'm finding that farmers are interested in in the UK are, is very much applied research on how do I implement like agroecological practices uh, even on my farm. So this sort of stuff like what you're doing, Ben, which is great, uh, but very probably specific to your farm. We're not sure that what you did on your farm that you could hand on heart say someone on a different soil type in another part of the country, is that gonna work? They might need something specific to them. So I get the feeling that farmers are really wanting that kind of really specific advice on how do I implement these practices on my farm, but it's hard as researchers to, because we have to work in more general kind of context and stuff. So I think there's a little bit of a misalignment there. And also, you know, we know that the researchers, again, get rewarded for Im high impact research so sort of is very kind of big picture and um, maybe not, you know, this work on Ben's farm might not get them promoted to be a professor, sadly. <laughs> so, yeah, I think there's a bit of a misalignment there sometimes, but we have to see how we can bridge that. 
Yeah, I just wanted to um, comment on that. I think, agree, fundamentally, I think we're all on the same page, that we all uh, want the same thing. Um, but there is, from my perspective, a disconnect in that I, I mean, I don't know about a lot of research that goes on. And I, I'm really, I mean, I'm kind of self-confessed geek. Like, I'm really interested in what's going on in the soil beneath my feet and the plant health and everything that's happening on the farms that I work at and the complexity of it all. But... I don't really know where to start in terms of engaging with research, but I'd be really interested to do so, and I know a lot of other farmers that would really love to get more involved. Um, so I think it's a theme that appears, has appeared a few times already in just our introductions, is this kind of communication, and I think that's a really important thing that could kind of start healing this relationship and also collaboration as well. Um, and also just what you mentioned there, Julia, is the things... We can't just focus on the one thing. We can't focus on one thing in the absence of everything else. Like nature is so complex, and we as farmers have a real understanding and knowing of our land, and everything is often context based. And one thing that is working on Ben's farm might not work on another farm, but that's when that communication and collaboration comes in and working as farmers in networks with the support of academics or people like ourselves that are really interested in running trials to support other farmers and really recognising that the beauty of nature and the complexity of it, but the, what that brings to research is this huge diversity and um, enables and empowers farmers to really understand what's happening on their own farm. Yeah, completely agree. All in, all, all in collaboration and just talking. It's all going to come through the communication side, but it's also on the... It's the publishing of results as well, because most farmers aren't going to read it unless it's in the Farmers Weekly, let's be honest. So it's, it's yeah, brilliant. We've got the data, we've got it done, but unless people are going to re read it and think of it and kind of think, oh, that, I might be able to implement that or I could at least think about it and consider it in the future, it's not going to happen. So we need to kind of link the end bit up as well as the start bit. It's awful, isn't it? <laughs> the whole thing is just... It's just communication, it's just getting out there, it's just talking, it's just going to events like this and just chat with people. Don't sit at home on TikTok. <laughs> I think, it, like what you said earlier, Ben, like we as growers and farmers, we have the power to like share all this knowledge between us as well, and that's the ripple effect, isn't it? And so if we work in collaboration with researchers and then we get empowered by that and then other people see what we're doing and get interested and we have a cup of tea with them and chat with them and then that's where the kind of spark happens. Yeah. Great, okay, thanks everyone. I think that was, yeah, kind of two things that came out for me was the, first of all, about the, you know, the, that while, while we're all on the, s the same page about, you know, we want to move to this, like, fabulous agroecological food and farming system, there are these different pressures that come, you know, obviously farmers are got to make a living, there's that, there's that side of it, and then if you're an academic, there are all these other pressures involved in, you know, progressing through your academic career, publishing, getting funding, and that those things can sometimes get in, you know, present a challenge to collaborating better because we have these other goals that don't quite align with each other as well as the shared vision and how we like work through that. And then moving on very much to talking about communication and, and in both directions and how that's probably the, you know, how that's probably the only way we can get through this and how we put the, through the challenges and collaborate better um, and the kind of benefits that there could be from doing that, that communication both between academics and and farmers, but within kind of farming communities, and I suppose within the academic research community as well. So yeah, already moving on to some of the, um, the kind of yeah, what we could what we could do about it. Um, yeah, in terms of, I just wanted to ask quickly to Ben and Holly. In terms of, you're both kind of yeah, you're both very much doing your own research on farm in the market garden. Um, on, on something that's very specifically kind of relevant to what you're doing. What, what was it that led you to, to you know, to, to, to find that, that particular gap in the, in the knowledge? And why was that that important? What was it that you were not seeing in, in was it just that you weren't aware of, other res of, of academic research or in the, in the area or other people doing, doing that kind of research? Sorry, I've asked that in a very roundabout way, but I think you get the gist of it. <laughs> uh, I get bored easily. Is, <laughs> is, is the main answer. I just, I'd like to try things. I like to keep things interesting. I mean, I don't like to say it, but if, I, if the farm was still running how dad and granddad would like the farm to be running, I probably wouldn't be that interested. But because I can have an influence and I want to do these weird and wacky and sometimes stupid things, um, it makes me interested. It makes me want to be more involved. And 
unless you're kind of passionate about something, you're not going to be interested, and I feel it like it's the right thing to do, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, but yeah, the reason why is because it's interesting. It's more fun. <laughs> Uh, yeah, curiosity, definitely. Um, just not interested in just doing a job and not understanding what is going on and why I'm doing it and how we're interconnected with everything around us and really being aware of like anything I do is going to have such a big impact on all the other living things around me. Um, I came across this really... Well, I was introduced to this really great quote recently by Alvin Toffler. Um, to grow, evolve, and adapt, we need to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Um, and that just really resonates because I just think we think we know, but the things that we know, there's loads of stuff we don't know, and we know that, but then there's loads of stuff that we don't know that we don't know. And so just kind of being really open and curious and willing to challenge the kind of current paradigm and explore different ways of moving in the world and why are things happening on the farm? Not just accepting them, like looking and exploring and, yeah, curiosity. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, and in terms of this, it's a slight sort of shift in direction. Um, we, we're talking a bit about the different pressures that there are in academia to, you know, meet certain targets and things like that. Um, and we touched up a fair amount on, on funding. Um, to what extent do you think that collaboration between... Um, practitioners and academics is limited by the way that, f that academic funding is is done and is that shifting is that you talked a little bit more about co-production and and yeah what what do you think about that there's there's definitely a shift happening um, how wide across academia that's happening it's hard for me to say but and there's a role that the funding body is playing in that shift because um, more and more you see it in in the call text for res for funding opportunities, they say must be co-produced, or they say must have at least one practitioner partner on the team, things like that, um, that the funding bodies are very much giving a strong steer that this cannot be just based in academia. And I think that's a little bit um, to do with the nature of the funding streams because the UKRI is very much now seeing it as societal challenges. That's that's the kind of research that they're funding is um, the research that tackles societal challenges. And in order to tackle societal challenges, this cannot just happen within university and within academia. This has to be done together with society, with the people who are on the ground experiencing these challenges. And so I think that is very well recognized and the funding bodies are pushing that. And I find it, slightly comical the way academics have responded because you see now, and I, and I read funding proposals and people throw the word co-production around. They say co-design, they say co-production. What's some other co -innovation, ones? Co-innovation, co-innovation. Co-creation, just put co in front of the word. Exactly, exactly. And, and I don't know, do they mean something different? Are they meaning the same thing? I don't think any of them really know, most of them probably don't know what they mean, but they know these are trigger words. These are key words that you've got to put in the proposal to convince them to give you the money. Um, and, and that, I said it's comical, it's irritating. <laughs> <laughs> Because you, as a reader, I, as a reviewer, I can see they don't know what they're talking about. This is not, I can see in the actions they've built into this project, this is not what they're doing. But I think there's movement, right? And we can learn from each other, and I think there is very good research practice out there, and it's about disseminating that, teaching colleagues, um, teaching the next generation, so ensuring that students going through the university process are learning about good research practice, including co-production. I think I lost track of the question, but hopefully. I'll just, just add something, because, um, yeah, the other thing that I was really racking my brain again for how do we, you, you gave us the question earlier about how do we get, yeah, 
people working in collaboratively. And I, I thought really it's about working also across disciplines, which is another one that the um, funding bodies are really asking us to be. And I actually don't know the difference, I'm sure you do, between transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and multidisciplinary. You probably know that, I have to Google it every time. I, um, but, but I think, you know, I'm a natural scientist and it's hard work for me to think like um, someone from a social science background, you know. And it's, if we, we need to be really encouraged to work with people from these different disciplines. And I've really, this year, got the most benefit from reading some books written by like social scientists and anthropologists like um, Chris Smage's book on saying no to a farm free future and then he cited this guy Glenn Davis Jones I think who's an anthropologist I've read his book uh, fantastic so I think the social scientists are really kind of leading the way in the, these new approaches to working collaboratively and we as natural scientists need to learn to work with social scientists again we have the same problem though with the co the co stuff is that people will write a, a proposals and and then they'll say, oh God, we need a social scientist. Okay, we'll put him in and work package, you know, 7.9 or something. Very much at the end of it all, um, kind of paying lip service to it. But but also, yeah, we need. And then it goes back to training, doesn't it? That we need the next generation of natural scientists to work, be able to work across disciplines, which is like things like your new masters sounds great for that. Yeah. Great, thanks. That's actually, yeah, some pretty positive things about, about funding and a kind of just, the, and what they're asking for and just a, I suppose, a, a kind of just like general cultural shift in how we approach research um, and how that will kind of catch up with, with these words of co-creation and things like that. Um, yeah, I was wondering um, what, from like kind of all different perspectives, and um, maybe starting with Ben and Holly, but it would be great to hear everyone's thoughts on what, what would, do you think would be kind of the benefits of better collaboration, I suppose, between re research that's kind of happening on farm and academic researchers, but also across disciplines and between sectors, like I think that's a useful thing to have in mind as well. Um, yeah, what could be the, the, the benefits if we, if we were better at this collaborating? Um, and do you have any practical ideas about what, that could, how, what could make that possible? <laughs> Uh, probably just it would allow more opportunities, definitely, and the sharing of knowledge would be the number one thing. Because, yeah, as I said before, there's no point doing something if no one hears about it. That's why I'm trying to promote the stuff I've done as much as possible. But, I mean, I'm not going to write a scientific paper on it. Sorry, guys. Because <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> I, I hate writing scientific <laughs> papers. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I don't really have any sort of practical how we could do it, just communicate more is the only answer, I think. Yeah, I think uh, the power of our two worlds coming together could be huge. Like, I think it's, you know, the potential is incredible there. And um, an it could be like an opportunity for researchers and academics to empower farmers to get more curious and then to continue that research as well. Like, I think there's so much potential in that. Um, and you know we could all benefit from being more curious. And I think by being involved with trials and academics, we can then expand the reach of what you do because as we said earlier, we're talking over the fence or work going on farm walks and sharing. And we have often have, farmers often have those networks set up. So rolling that out further and expanding the reach of what you do. And I think the key thing, I don't, as I said earlier, I'm not kind of sure entirely of a lot of research projects that are happening other than things I come into, uh, come across like innovative farmers and things like that, but involving us from the start, I think you mentioned earlier, Julia, we're often kind of thought of at the last <laughs> kind of point in the process, whereas like asking us what we need and what would be relevant to us, I think from the start would help engage farmers from the start. I think there's loads of benefits from collaboration and I, I love doing it. Um, in a, within academia, collaborating across disciplines, um, a project I'd put together, I was, I was in a group with another colleague who was a, a data scientist, another one who did human-computer interaction was his specialty. I'd never even heard of that. And, and then another one was a modeler, and the stuff they were talking about, I, was, I said to them, 
you can do that. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, we can do that. And I thought, amazing, because suddenly it opened up a whole new world of questions that I could ask because they had methods for testing those uh, that, that I wouldn't have been able to get at with my own sort of approaches to research. So within academia, it's fantastic. And then with practitioner partners, it's wonderful. You know, I work with, I, I spend probably more of my time with non-academics than I do with academics. And, you know, the things will come up and they'll say, well, I had this idea to do this. And I'm like, ooh, that'd be really interesting. You know, I could, I could do some research bit around that to generate the evidence, basically, that would then help you go forward to get the funding or support or whatever you need to be able to do that action on a wider scale. So it's, it's I think, you know, because that today, what really resonates with policy, it, it's about evidence-based policy. So all the politicians, they want, they want evidence. Give us the evidence that this intervention works. You know, if we create this policy, we want evidence that it works. And so, you know, to play along with that, I, that's what the academics can do with practitioners, is help to generate that evidence so it's no longer anecdotal. Well, this worked for me, and I talked to some of my farmer, neighbors, and it worked for them too, that doesn't resonate with policy in today's society, for better or for worse. It, and, and they want evidence. And that's, I think, where that collaboration can really provide those impactful benefits. Um, and then I was just going to say, because I work um, in the Food Policy Alliance Cymru. I think we might have one. I'm not sure if she's in here. but. Um, we're a group of organizations that collaborate and work together to try and shift Welsh policy to deliver food systems transformation, essentially. And, you know, within that group, I'm one of two academics, and I think we're about 11 organizations represented. And it's, it's brilliant because we all bring different strengths to the table. And, um, you know, while there's different sort of things that each organization is kind of advocating for. Collectively, we have a vision. And I think it's quite funny at times because depending on what the event or the activity, my colleagues might say, oh, well, you know what? Why don't you speak at that? Because you're the academic. And somehow, because I'm the academic, it's assumed that I'm bias-free and it's neutral evidence that I'm presenting and therefore far more plausible than if they, as an advocacy organization, get up and say the exact same thing. Um, academics aren't neutral, we aren't bias-free, but for whatever, you know, better for worse again, it's how sort of policy makers and others view academics. So I think, you know, we can capitalize on that. We can use it as a strength and use it to promote the agenda to get the transformations that we need to be making. Okay. Thank you. I forgot the last one. I forgot what the question was. I think it was about uh, benefits. Of, well, I was going to say, anyway, Holly, I think you mentioned about um, how yeah, you guys have probably all kinds of questions that would be great to work more closely with researchers on. And so I think since I've come to ORC, it's been great because that kind of brick, red brick wall that I was behind at Newcastle University and the farmers is completely gone and all of our work with ORC is directly with farmers. So I'm finding it really a very organic experience that the ideas and questions are just flowing so freely from all these organic farmers in our networks. And it's really exciting to kind of yeah, come up with really interesting questions. Because I've always said as a researcher, I think the hardest thing is sometimes coming up with the question, what's the right question? But now there's this great flow of questions and ideas and new ways of looking at things coming. So that's been really great. The other great benefit also is, of course, as researchers, we always have to demonstrate impact. And again, in a university setting, you, it's a bit of an extra step sometimes. You do the research, and then you do the knowledge exchange and outreach, whereas now, because we work so closely with farmers directly, that basically it's just built right in. That knowledge is getting transferred right there. And then there's farm walks and all kinds of farmer kind of activities going around so it's been it's a really beneficial way to work yeah it's great yeah that's really interesting I think yeah I think the organic research center ap approach to research is a, a, an interesting model to learn from for that um, I think um, we've got 15 minutes left so I'm going to open up to questions in the hall um, we've got 
one at the back. I'll, I'll just say, because we're being live streamed, please wait for the microphone and speak into it. And we also, Hannah's taking questions from the live stream at the back as well. Uh, that was brilliant, really. want to congratulate everybody. Um, so my name's Professor Steve Newman. Um, I think the, uh, I've come up with a, a good question that might help bring people together. And I just wanted to check whether you think it's appropriate. So my que the research question, the joint question would be, how can we help Ben and, and his customers and people like him increase their assets 100-fold within five years through, through our thinking. So, the, so for me, the most important thing is to empower these innovators and the people like that, and they need assets. So we need to think about that and how to increase them 100-fold within five years. So is your... Your question is, um, how, how useful do we think that is as a collaborative question yeah. to be approaching? Do you want to start us off, Ben? Would that be interesting to you as a question to work on? <laughs> is, it, is it really about that ultimately we should be looking at the financial return from any research and collaboration no, we're doing? it's nothing to do with that. Oh, okay. It's about societal transformation. The question was very carefully phrased. So assets, what are they? Yeah, could you repeat the question? Yeah, so <laughs> how could we collectively bring about societal transformation through bringing research and practitioners together, being driven by this question? How could we increase the assets of people like Ben and his customers 100-fold within five years? So by assets, we look at the five capitals approach, which is financial capital is one of them. There is human cap capital, technical capital, natural capital, and physical capital. And it's up to the, the group to actually say which ones they want to focus on and how they're going to measure it. But the key thing is capital. And I, I work about 20, uh, 12 miles from Ben... I've been doing intercropping for 40 years in Middle Claydon, and I'm aware of what the possibilities are with the Bicester town itself. And basically, for me, the core is the land. So we, we basically, land you've got there is 20,000 a hectare to buy, and if we can do the right things, it's worth two million. So by capturing this land betterment value along with improved assets, that's, that's one possible mechanism. <laughs> okay, so I think that, that was a tough one. Um, <laughs> but your further explanation helped. And I think, you know, it comes down to where your area of interests are. I, I think social capital and ecological capital are some of the most powerful tools in the toolbox and the most important things, um, assets to a farmer. I mean, and we've talked about those. Um, we've talked more about the social capital, you know, the networks, the, the farmers that you've had onto your farm to share with them the results of the work that you've done. And I've heard it again and again, you know, the importance of that farmer to farmer peer learning and being able to see what works in practice, what were the challenges that were overcome and how could this work for for you, the, the other farmer visiting. And so there's that social capital element that's so important in terms of generating that transformation and learning from each other and learning the successes. And then that is what's going to help us to improve the ecological capital because that's what we need to be continuing. And that's what agroecology is all about, is building up our ecological capital, the resource base, because the land is the most important thing. But we've, we've eroded that and destroyed that over the last 40, 50 years. And now we've got to build that back again to be healthy so that we can reap those products from the land that we benefit from. So I think those two are quite powerful and they go together hand in hand. The yeah, one so, sorry, I'm not in... <laughs> I didn't want an answer. 
Oh, good. The point is about the point is the power of the question. You know, the integration of, pe of partners is driven by the question. The question is the most important thing to unify academic research and societal transformation, achieve society. <laughs> So it's about, you know, reflecting on the power of the question because so long we try to help the income of farmers or, or whatever, we try to do agroecological stuff. That's working on the wrong level for societal transformation. Societal transformation is more about distribution of assets. So it was, it was to try and get reflections on the power of the question and how the question could be refined to be even more powerful. <laughs> I don't think I need to add anything, although, although I did say it, uh, earlier that defining the question is the most difficult part of research, so <laughs> yeah, that's, and we've maybe been answering the wrong question, and I think that's, that's mm -hmm. true, like in historically we have, so yeah. Anyone else have any thoughts on it as a question to, to start from? No, it is a good question. I had a, um, an old lecturer at um, Harper Adams that used to say to me what's the mission what's the vision and that's kind of what you're talking about in a way but I never really understood that then and <laughs> let, let alone now <coughs> but I mean it comes uh, I don't know how you'd ever do it in five years but it comes from the kind of stuff that I want to keep doing I want to keep improving I want to increase the social capital of people I want to have more people on the farm I want to increase the financial productivity of the farm. I got to keep running a business. I want to improve everything, every aspect on the farm. I want all those environmental benefits. I want as much biodiversity as possible on the farm. But how you balance them all is blimmin' difficult, as you're well aware. I think, just to add for me, I mean, I feel a bit bamboozled by that question, but I think it kind of highlights the the disconnect in the, um, the language <laughs> used, and I'm not really comfortable with the term assets. Um, I think it's like I'm a steward of the land living in reciprocity with other living communities, and I want to continue to do that and learn more about what's alive around me. And I guess I could have more time to reflect on the question, but that's, that's what I have to say right now. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, do we have any questions online? And yes, then we have a question from an independent researcher who's not associated with any institutions, asking um, what advice would you give to finding funding and also how would you approach disseminating the knowledge created? Uh, what approach... So, sorry, could you... Who, who is it from? Um, I don't have their name, but they're an independent researcher. An independent researcher. So the question was... Um, so it's about how, how, how do you do this sort of stuff without institutional support, basically, um, in terms of creating it, finding funding, and disseminating it. Can you? That's the question. So as how can you do research? Researcher. It's an independent researcher. How would you go about finding funding, disseminating it, doing the actual research without kind of institutional right. support? And we'll presume, Is that possible? Um, your research, you, you want, you, you need a partner in your research, whatever your, where's your research question coming from? unless it's just one you've just come up with, but uh, presumably there's some, some partners and collaborators that, are, that you're working with to come up with the questions, I guess, and then you wanna, and that's the basis of beginning kind of a collaborative project and looking for, yeah, funding organizations that might, uh, might support it, that's, yeah, that's. So I suppose, would that be, you know, for example, if you were collaborating with farmers in your local area, it might be looking for funding that that was for farmer-led type projects or the, the kind of, yeah, the collaborate, the, that was aimed at the groups you're collaborating with kind yeah. of thing, yeah. I think to be honest, and if I've read that correctly, an independent researcher without an institution, um, that's, that's what I'm reading it as. It's, it's really hard. If you're not already attached to an organization, it's really hard then to apply for funding because funding bodies typically want to give the funds to, it, while it's awarded to an individual, it's as part of an organization. And there's all kinds of legal and contractual reasons for that. And so there are some creative ways to work around that, but ultimately you need to build relationships with people who are based in an organization. And those are the ones who need to lead on that funding proposal, really. And it might be if 
Uh, it might be that you would be employed contractually with that organization if the research were granted and that would cover your costs for your time kind of thing, but you do have to be more creative and it is much more challenging if you were not attached to an organization. It doesn't have to be a higher education organization, but you need to be attached to an organization. Yeah, I would, I would just say on that, like I think there is, there is so much research that's done not, you know, not on farm or by academic institutions like I know the land, we, like the Land Workers Alliance. We do loads of research. Sometimes we take on freelance researchers, um, and I know the NGOs do a lot of research, produce a lot of reports. They might take on freelance researchers to do that work, but but the actual what the research is focused on is probably at least fairly heavily influenced by the like what's interesting to that work organization, what this, the questions might be set in advance, but I would say that that's a way that you can do quite a lot of interesting, impactful research that someone, someone else or an organization have, they at least think is gonna be useful. So that is a way of, of approaching it. Um, do we have one more question here? Thank you, thank you to the panel. Um, my name's Jill Robbie, I'm a, a university lecturer at Glasgow University. Um, and I've just got a question. We've kind of touched on it uh, from a number of different perspectives, but in relation to getting farmers and crofters as research uh, participants to do co-production, about the specific benefits that you can promise or suggest as being part of the research process. Um, I was just involved in a bid recently where we couldn't pay the farmers or crofters to be part of it. So if, if you're doing stakeholder engagement, actually they are the people who are unpaid um, in the room, the only people who are unpaid in the room. Um, and sometimes the only thing that we can do to build in that into the research is to give them a 50 pound voucher. Um, and some of these communities are, are, are very over-researched if we're looking at marginalized groups. So I wonder if the panel has any perspectives on that kind of inequality uh, in relation to research participation. And sometimes I think it's really difficult to say, oh, the, the outcome will be that you will speak to me and I will then influence national policy, um, uh, rather than, you know, there will be an increase in production on your farm or your croft. I think that's a really good question. Um, I wonder if we should start with the, start with a farmers and growers perspective on, on that kind of question and then move on to researchers. Academic researchers? Yeah, I mean, it's one thing we haven't really touched on and that, like, that is often a barrier. I know that uh, the system that I work in is, you know, we're, we work in a food system where we're under very tight margins and under a lot of pressure and come June, everything else falls off the radar other than producing the veg. So um, I think recognising that getting people that are working on the land involved in any of this research is a challenge in the first place. So yeah, I think recognising farmers and growers' time and their contribution. And yeah, there does need to be some kind of reward for that in a way when we have to be um, reimbursed for our time, I think, to engage people. And even then that might not be enough. I think empowering them with the knowledge, from my point of view, if you're engaging in a research project, being able to continue that and those things that you learn beyond that project and cascading that out further would, would encourage me to be involved. Like, what am I going to get out of this beyond just knowing something further about my land or how I, the way I grow, but also upskilling me at the same time so that I could potentially do more of that in the future without the help from an academic and then share that knowledge with my colleagues and my friends and other growers. I think that would be... Yeah, it's tricky, the financial aspect, because from my perspective I'm not the only person reliant on the farm I'm not in the, I'm not even the only family reliant on the farm for an income so if a for me to apply for a, a grant or to do some research it has to make financial sense or otherwise I got to fund the thing myself <laughs> um, so how I approached the intercropping trials I did I wanted just to have my costs covered and any benefit we got from the harvesting afterwards that would effectively pay for my time and all the effort it takes because it's not easy it takes a blimmin lot of time and I had to do loads of other things on top of that as well producing videos and stuff for the Farmers Guardian and sponsors and talking for the sponsors and that kind of stuff um, so yeah it's 
it's tricky. You, it's, it's just got to make financial sense, and unless it's covered, then I'm not interested because I I have a life as well. I have a full time job as well. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. Yeah, I agree. I think it is really tricky, and I'm really conscious. Um, and so grateful to farmers that work with us because I'm conscious that it often it is a, a burden we're probably imposing on them. To, um, so in our work, I mean, yeah, sometimes it's possible, or I've been in other projects where a, a some financial compensation is available to the farmers. This is for sort of on-farm trial stuff. Uh, sometimes that's possible. Um, the other thing I try to do in ORC now, I'm trying to do more and more, is make sure that, again, that site-specific information knowledge from that specific location, the farmer is really benefiting. So we're sort of moving on that spectrum from kind of general applied research into almost consultancy. And so those farmers that we work with, I'm trying to move towards that we're really giving them some individual consultancy and benefit, and while also kind of making some more general conclusions that we can use <coughs> in our work, but um, but it's challenging. I saw one of our farmers here, but I don't know if he's still here. Mark was here. Oh, you're way at the back. <laughs> well, there's Mark Lee, who's one of our like poster boys of collaboration with ORC, and I've always wondered why he does it, <laughs> or what he gets out of it, but I don't know if he's willing to say in the, in the room, I put him on the spot, but I'm just curious, you know, because he's very involved in a lot of our work. I don't know if he'd mind saying something, Mark. We really do stuff that's interesting to us, um, and I think that's where we get the return from. So if we really believe it's a value to us, and I guess important, but there is a limit to how much we can give, and, and it is an issue. Clearly, it is an issue, so I appreciate anything in the future, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I can just add a little bit. I completely identify with the challenge um, because it is, it is, it's everywhere within academia. And um, I think that some of the things, it's about, are you asking the right question that's actually of interest to the farming community and to farmers? Because if it is, then through that mechanism, you'll be able to get some participants and the benefit is because it's of interest to them. This is maybe a challenge that they're facing, something that they identify with perhaps. Um, also it's about, I think, very simple thing like venue. You know, are you asking them to come to you like within the university environment, which can be quite foreign, or you know, are you taking it to them within their communities? Like I was recently told, you want to get farmers there, go to the local pub. Use the, use the meeting room in the local pub. It'd be far easier and much more interest. Um, so, I mean, there's different mechanisms, but I also, yeah, I don't think I've yet found myself in a situation where I couldn't also pay money for, to, to recognize the value of their time. So, I think, you know, there are different UKRI grants with different rules and stipulations, and I've heard other people make those complaints, but I haven't yet had that problem myself. So um, also just generously compensating people for time as, as I would want to be. Um, I think we're coming to the end, so we're going to wrap up there. But just worth saying on that last question, it's also one of the things that, that uh, as the Agroecology Research Collaboration, it's one of the questions that we try and work out. You know, like, yeah, how do we not, yeah, we talked a little earlier about the extractivist relationship, like how do we mitigate against that? And I think um, I d yeah, ideally, you, you, pay, you pay people and you put that in the grant right from the start, but then, you know, students, for example, PhD students, master students, they often do a lot of research with farmers and don't have any money to pay. Um, and what other ways um, are there to, to yeah, to, to balance that out? Um, we've had some master students who've done kind of case study approaches and they've actually gone and worked for a couple of weeks in the summer during a busy season as they did that research and like that as a kind of way of doing it. So there's there's a lot of different ways, but I'm always happy to chat to people about that if you're interested. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about the Agroecology Research Collaboration, um, you can Google us. We've got a, a website and um, we've got a newsletter you can sign up to too for a kind of information about what's going on um, and our conference that we'll be doing next year. So thanks very much. And thank you so much to the panel. Thank you all, all for sharing your experiences.